Well, there's two commercial varieties or strains of mint that is produced in the United States. One is spearmint and the other is peppermint. This is peppermint. It's a little bit darker uh, in color. It has the, it basically is the same plant other than it does produce a peppermint type oil. And the oil is produced in oil glands that are found on the backside of the leaf. And if you can look at it carefully, you can see it glistening. And yes, that's, I've heard that it glistens. It shows that the, the oil glands are filling with oil. When I look across the countryside looking for a peppermint field, I look for the darkest green field. That usually will be the peppermint field. Okay, there are three different uh, varieties of mint grown in this country. Uh, peppermint, uh, Scotch spearmint, and native spearmint. Uh, the, the peppermint varieties are the ones that are a darker variety. Both the spearmint varieties are a lighter green, have a little smaller leaf, and uh, they stand up uh, more than uh, the peppermint. The peppermint one it actually reaches a height of uh, five feet tall, but to look at it in the field after it's lodged, it uh, is more like a foot, 18 inches high. These are the, the two basic uh, uh, types of plant, the two basic spearmint plants that are grown for oil. Uh, on your right, on my left, uh, a typical uh, mature peppermint plant, uh, and, and that's distinguished by its somewhat darker green color, uh, the terminal bloom uh, that you see here, and, and the purple stem, a characteristic uh, of the group of uh, peppermint plants belonging to the, the, the genus Menthopiperita. Next to it, much lighter in color, as you can see in a different bloom habit uh, with these uh, is the typical one of two different spearmint species that are grown. This happens to be uh, so-called Scotch spearmint, Mentha cardiaca. It's characterized by a lighter color uh, and, and the bloom, as you can see, instead of being totally on the terminal part of the shoot uh, occurs further down on the stem in, in the uh, angle or the axial uh, of, of the leaves, uh, which, which characterizes that particular plant. But although they're two very closely related plant species, they produce uh, two very different and distinct types of oils. It is a dark green color. Uh, nothing more beautiful than a nice clean field of peppermint just before harvest. Slight touch of bloom, but the deep green color is very impressive. Uh, as you can see at the apex here, we have a terminal bud that's starting to come out. And as you get around 5% bloom, these will be pink blooms, that usually is a good indication that it's uh, about the time to harvest. In the plant, there are certain components that the oil users, buyers, and the Wrigley's and the Colgate's like to have in their oil. And it's about that period where we've found over the years that uh, maturity is when you have about 5% bloom in the field. And we'll be probably harvesting this field in about another 10 days. Because we'll cut this mint, let it dry for, oh, two, no more than three days and we'll start raking it up and chopping it. There is a lot of interest in growing mint in other places in the world, but mint is a very region-specific uh, material. It, it, the quality is determined by length of day, photo period, by the soil, by climate. You could virtually get in a car in Michigan and travel down through Indiana and Wisconsin and travel west to the Pacific Ocean and touch mint in each state. Uh, historically, mint has had or demanded a lot of water for uh, growth. And in this area, in the Midwest, we used uh, generally muck soils, which were uh, very wet soils. Then when the irrigation opened up in the Pacific Northwest, uh, there were mint, uh, mint plants taken out there, grown there very uh, uh, effectively. Primary mint growing areas is the Midwest, which is Indiana, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan. Uh, the next, uh, the largest mint growing state actually is Oregon, which has the Willamette Valley, uh, which is in uh, western 
uh, west of the mountains in Oregon, uh, the Madras area, which is in central Oregon, um, and then the very eastern part of Oregon has some mint also, and that ties into the Idaho area, what they call the Treasure Valley of Idaho, near Boise, Idaho. And then two areas, really an area in Washington in the Yakima Valley, uh, and then also the upper uh, area of the Yakima Valley, which is a Columbia Basin area, uh, our mint growing region. So those are the principal areas along with uh, Montana, which is one of the newer areas in the west. Um, there's mint in South Dakota, a little bit in uh, North Dakota, Minnesota, uh, Utah, Nevada, Northern California are the main areas, but uh, each of those areas tend to just be a smaller number of growers, and in some cases only one grower. And mint is one of the few crops that you get a higher yield the farther north you go, because the day lengths are, sh are longer during the summer. So all, 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 all other things being equal, why you have to get as far north as you can without having winter kill problems. And also, and also mint seems to do better at lower elevations. And the, probably the amazing thing, I think one of the things I really enjoy about this industry is that the exact same plant, again, because it's a sterile plant, it doesn't produce a seed, that same plant, if it were planted in uh, Indiana or the Willamette Valley, Madras, Idaho, Yakima Valley, any of the growing regions, exact same plant will yield a different yielding uh, from a quantitative standpoint of oil, uh, but more importantly, a different quality of oil. You'll get a recognizably different quality from each area, and that's what the flavorist is looking for. Well, we also found that each region had specifically uh, different types of oils, different flavor characteristics, different analytical characteristics. And those oils, uh, or those regions, were developed uh, on a gradual basis as uh, they began to find their way into commerce, uh, flavors to begin to use those with Midwest oils. And uh, still many of your old line companies still use Midwest oil as kind of a base oil, but they are using other oils in a blend. As a mint dealer, or my colleagues uh, would be say the same, I'm sure, is that they're not in the business of deciding which is the best mint. The best mint is what your customer wants. What he wants, though, is consistent quality. He wants it uh, to be the same uh, character from drum to drum, from year to year, so that he can put it in his product with some assurance of uh, consistency. Most people, although they don't realize it, have a, a pretty fine sense of taste and smell and customers like to have their own unique identity with their mint product. If you buy a pack of Wrigley's Double Mint Gum, before you ever open it up and put the stick of gum in your mouth, if you've been chewing it in the past, you already know what it's gonna taste like. And they have created their own unique formula of using mint oils from various areas from various suppliers and so on to make that double mint flavor. The, the growers, the, the handlers and processors and the end users are, are, are well connected together to, to produce a, a quality product at the end of the day. It starts at the farm uh, where the farmer raises the crop and then from the crop distills the oil. At that stage, uh, the dealers step in, uh, handle the oil, and take it to their facilities for processing. And what does a handler do? A handler provides uh, the barrels to the farmers to put their oil in, and uh, they'll also provide storage for that oil if the farmer doesn't want to sell for at that time. And uh, they'll keep the farmer updated on what the prices are so that uh, if he's ready to sell, he'll know what the market is. We call, I call our, ourselves mint dealers uh, in certain uh, areas of the trade, such as the MIRC and the Far West Spearmint Marketing Order. I believe they call us mint handlers. A handler purchases oil from the farmers and uh, formulates the oil to the specifications of the customers on the other end of the market that we do business with. Primarily end users who manufacture products that uh, the consumer might recognize in the stores. 
but also we sell to flavor houses, another segment of the industry that uh, the flavor houses in turn uh, put together flavor compounds for smaller companies. From a quality standpoint, we're there to provide the first line of quality control for a raw material that comes from the farm. Oil as it's produced at the farm, and that's the tailgate crop of the farmer, uh, varies from, from container to container, and it has to be standardized. Beyond that, it has to be probably rectified or, or conditioned further. Uh, before it's suitable for the marketplace. We buy the oil from the farmers in 55 gallon drums. Uh, that oil uh, then is taken into our uh, warehouse uh, in each of the locations out west or here in the Midwest we bring it into this location here at Center Street. Uh, the sample is sent to our Bremen facility here where we uh, check that oil on three different uh, uh, chemical analysis that oil then uh, is trucked back here uh, to our Bremen location or possibly our Niles location. We know exactly which drums we want to put into which blends uh, and we'll sort the oil out and then we will do a uh, preliminary blend of all the oils. Right here we have a blending operation. Uh, our foreman here, uh, Todd Garverson, is in the process of blending uh, oil into this large 40 drum vat. Uh, he's pumping oil uh, out of these 55-gallon drums, uh, which contains a quantity of 400 pounds each, uh, through a series of filters into this large 40-drum uh, vat. Uh, we let that uh, set for a period of a few hours, uh, and then we will uh, continue then to pump that over into uh, uh, another series of drums, which is the final blend of the particular lot that we are uh, putting together for a customer. The process of how we blend min oils uh, at the Liebermuth Company, or M. Brown and Sons, uh, through a system of piping. Right now they're putting together a blend for, uh, for one of our customers where they'll blend, you know, two or three different origins of uh, domestic peppermint and, uh, and fill it and ship it uh, to these folks. I say there are five major mint dealers. Now, I'm sure that would offend some companies, but um, there are five of us out there who are buying mint oil from all of the major geographic productions in the U.S., North America, and we're selling uh, to a broad spectrum of the industry in other words, the large companies in the U.S. We're number five. We're, we're the smallest of the bunch. So, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, competitive, but we work together uh, a lot uh, in organizations such as the Men Industry Council uh, for the benefit of the industry as a whole. American farmers produce the highest quality product, in my opinion. Um, I think that it's the opinion of uh, uh, most of the people in the industry that we produce the highest quality peppermint oil. Otherwise, we wouldn't be growing it. Other people can grow it a lot cheaper. The U.S. industry is, really bases itself today on its quality, which is, is the premium quality product in the world. This isn't the right shovel. I'm just destroying the crop here. <laughs> this is a typical mint plant. Uh, the roots are real shallow. Actually, they only grow about four inches into the ground. You see a lot of rhizomes here that are growing. This is a good, healthy plant. that has got lots of little uh, hair roots on it. Uh, the mint spreads with these stolons. They grow along the ground, and eventually these will put out roots and grow another uh, stock of mint. The, the common nomenclature in the vernacular is the grower calls them roots, <laughs> but they're not truly roots. Uh, they are really stems. They're modified stems that, that become runners, uh, extensions of the plant at the soil surface or immediately below the surface. Uh, their function is, is essentially twofold. One of them is, is essentially that of the spread of the plant 
because as they, as they move out, they then take root and give rise to new plants where they come in contact with the soil. But that's also in, in areas where winters are severe enough to kill down the, the growing, the vegetative or the growing top of the plant. This is the structure that survives from one season to the next, from, from one year to the next. And so it has a dual function. It has a function of spread on a local basis. And it has a function of survival from one growing season to the next in areas where winters are sufficiently severe uh, that the, the vegetative or the top part of the plant would not survive. In the fall of the year, we'll take these roots in about four inches of soil and we'll dig those, put them in a planter and plant them. And we can plant a root that size or even smaller and by the following spring we'll have a plant that sends up a stock and a whole other root system will develop. But that's uh, essentially what we're doing here. We grow roots and plants and oil. Well, uh, when we first started raising mint, they used to uh, go across the field with a uh, team of horses and they had a double opener, something like this here, that would uh, open a furrow and then the guys would carry the roots in a bag, a burlap bag, and they'd just drop a root in uh, at a time and kick the dirt over it, and one root end to end, go across the field. They're probably lucky if they got an acre planted in a day. What they did, they would bring um, <clears throat> the mint stolons into the field and in a pile. Um, the laborers would simply go to that pile. They used, generally most of them would simply use a, a burlap bag, fill that bag uh, with those and sling it over their shoulder with a rope tied uh, to the top and the bottom and then walk down an open furrow and drop them into that furrow and step on them as they went uh, to sort of embed them in the furrow. And then they, then they would come behind them generally with some sort of a tool, uh, generally tractor drawn or in the early days horse drawn to close that, that furrow. And uh, this was still uh, not totally done, but still widely done when I first began to work in the crop in the late 1940s. That was still widely used. Oh, acres and acres. I was the fastest planter in a whole bunch. Uh, you had a gunny sack, put the roots in the gunny sack, and went down the row and dropped roots. Uh, I was known as a good mint planter, uh, one of the best, in fact, and I could plant about an acre a day. I had one uh, guy tell a uh, crew of men that George Colley could plant more mint than your whole crew. You could plant an acre a day, uh, one person. So you were out there eight hours? Uh huh. Doing that straight? Mm hmm. So two bits an hour, eight hours, how much is that? <laughs> that's a lot of work. $2 for planting an acre. That's a, that's a lot of walking out the sun. Yeah, but in those days we, we were men. <laughs> No, I enjoyed it. It was it was it was a challenge to beat the next guy. I'm here in Madras, Oregon, with Bill Towery, and I'm learning a little bit about weeds. Bill, what do we have here? This weed is salsify. It's a milkweed, and it's hard to kill chemically. All the milkweeds are harder to kill with chemicals than the others. This weed disperses around over the field quite easily though by the wind. Uh, the seeds are parachute carried and if you blow on that you'll see what I'm talking about. They travel like little parachutes. I don't think I like this weed. Well it's not as bad as this one. This one is kochia. It also has small, much smaller seeds and they blow all over and it is uh, probably the worst weed we have now that surfaced recently in Madras area. And this is why people hired uh, men and women to go out in the fields and to remove the weeds, and why now you use a uh, herbicide to do that. Well, the, uh, the cost of labor is the reason we use the herbicide, and the weed 
will contaminate the flavor and odor of the peppermint. The mint is a clean crop and uh, it's really essential that we keep the oil totally free of weeds so that we maintain this fresh, uh, weed-free tasting, which we call mint oil flavors. In the early days in mint, they uh, thought that weeds never hurt mint because weeds weren't supposed to have any oil in them and uh, water grass and things like that, and, and it wouldn't bother. But it didn't take long to find out it did. There was a lot of weeds like mare's tail and some of that that did have an oil and a tar, and, and so the buyers uh, uh, got pretty fussy about buying uh, fields that had too many weeds in them. Originally, uh, we used geese, which sounds odd, I suppose, in this day and age, but uh, there were no uh, farm chemicals in, in those days to, uh, to help us out in the, uh, in the control of weeds. Well, you, you hoed, but uh, all you could. But plants like water grass, there ain't no way you can hoe that because it comes up faster and you can hoe it. So uh, we got uh, geese, and uh, they work real good on water grass. And lambs also work good. Well, we had, we had to do some fencing for those geese. They'd get on a neighbor's place. We had different varieties of them. One variety was a they'd holler and make noise daytime and night. But, but the story with the geese in the western areas is always an interesting and entertaining one. And, and, uh, and they were and, and continue to be in some instances quite effective. The geese uh, never did the complete job. We uh, used several different pieces of farm equipment to uh, keep the weeds from uh, germinating, but uh, a lot of times uh, that wasn't enough and the weed and the geese were a big help in that time to uh, to control the weeds. In the western area where, where geese were and are still used, their, primarily, their primary weed problems were the grasses. And, and geese forage or graze literally on grasses primarily. And so as long as the choice was between grass and mint, uh, they would eat the grass. We'd start out buying a bunch of little goslings in the spring and, uh, and keep them through the summer. And uh, they would eat the grass, the grass weeds. We had, uh, I think, about three different varieties of geese that we used. And a lot of Farmers used them around under the geese. Sheep, they've used sheep for the same reason, eat the weeds. Often farmers used uh, sheep rather than geese because they were available. Uh, sometimes a farmer might have a problem of grass or weeds showing up in his field unexpectedly and uh, there's no goslings available, so then he needs to buy, uh, preferably, yearling lambs. I haven't seen no geese for a long time, but they're still using sheep. Had sheep, uh, they was a little rougher on a field. They would kind of cave in your rows where you tried to irrigate out of, and, and that was a little tougher, but yeah, we used them too. I remember at one point I had 300 lambs and 900 geese, and that was almost a job in itself, taking care of them, but that did uh, really uh, work good on your mint fields. Of course, you'd have to move them from field to field and, and get them up and, and uh, catch them. And lots of times, they'd, uh, they'd, they'd bite you if they had a chance. I understand you were the commander of all the geese. <laughs> well, I wasn't the commander of geese, but I, I did help. You had to be, they had to be pinned up every night. So uh, you had to make sure to be home before it got dark to get the geese pinned up and, and uh, had to watch them. And, and uh, they had the animals that was get into them. So there, you did, you had to watch them. You just had to watch them like uh, they was pets or kids because they was gonna get in trouble. Yes, I've lost uh, lots of geese. We, uh, we, we ha uh, 
got what they called a pop gun. It was run off of uh, gas, and it, you could set it so it uh, went off like every 15 minutes or every 20 or half hour. And, and uh, that worked pretty good, scaring coyotes away. And I've seen lots of times where old geese would come up at night and sit around close to that pop gun because it was keeping the coyotes scared away. We had to protect the geese from predators. Uh, you had coyotes that would get into them, uh, dogs that would get into them. Yes, we lost a lot of geese to dogs. The coyotes, you always hear, would just kill the sick ones. Well, they killed everything they could get a hold of, and they, they killed them just for the fun of it. They would go through and bite, bite a goose in the head and not kill it, but it would die in three or four days. Doesn't sound like you like coyotes. No, we don't like coyotes. <laughs> That's the one aspect of farming that you, you're glad to see uh, new stuff come. come. Well, they came out with a new chemical called Sinbar. 1965 and 66 were the first years that uh, we used uh, the trefflin in, in the weed control in mint. And that, that was another major breakthrough in management uh, to be able to uh, uh, now not go in and, and disturb that crop by, uh, by tillage uh, or the expense of hand weeding uh, and uh, still be able to meet uh, uh, the uh, demands of the industry for uh, weed-free or near-weed-free uh, uh, oils. In our area, although grasses uh, are a problem, but our weed problems are much more diverse and there are many weed species that neither geese nor sheep would eat and as a consequence uh, they were not nearly as effective in our area. Now they have spray but before when my dad used to hire about 50 to 100 people and weed on their hands and knees across the field on the first year of mint you know you'd, you'd that was worse you know we'd try to cultivate but you had to weed it it was a lot of work. Hot, the black dirt gets real hot when the sun shines on it. <laughs> One thing that my family's always taken out of pride in is a good weed-free field. So when they occasionally do pop up, which of course they do, my grandpa will send me out here with three or four other people and he'll ask me to just walk up and down the rows and pull out these mainly grass-type weeds by hand. And he'll just have me grab them kind of by the base near the root and pull them straight out like that so I get the root and everything and just place them on top of the the plant like that so they dry out better and the sun will just dry them out and blow them away and they won't reseed that way. How long were you out in the field? Oh this field took about 30 hours I'd say with three other people and myself. How do you feel about weeds today? I hate them. <laughs> I just finished weeding my flower bed today. <laughs> Brings back a lot of memories. <laughs> An even more onerous task was uh, weeding uh, uh, after the crop uh, got in because, uh, again, especially after that first year uh, when it began to uh, emerge as a solid stand uh, in the field and could not be cultivated, uh, then it was necessary to go in by hand and chop or pull or whatever uh, to, to try to limit the amount of weed uh, growth that there was in the field. I can tell you right now that it was us kids out in the field pulling all those weeds that made that oil so pure. We had, uh, see myself, my older brother, and my twin brother and sister, and another sister. We were all down there. And another younger sister and a, another little brother. <laughs> of course, they didn't do much, but <laughs> they were there. Did you get paid for that work? Just our meals. <laughs> <laughs> Just our meals. And, and it wasn't just limited to the youngsters. I mean, the wives and everybody was out there uh, and on the farm and, and, and doing these tasks. But, but they would hire people, local people, and, um, and, and the, both men and women, large numbers. And in those days, uh, 
jobs were scarce, particularly part-time work of that sort. And they would hire people, local people, and, uh, and, and uh, both men and women, large numbers. And in those days, uh, jobs were scarce, particularly part-time work of that sort. Yeah, at one time we hired itinerant labor um, from Chicago. Um, there were labor agents over there who would uh, fill your order. And then he'd put them aboard a train to Bangor, Michigan, which is a community about 10 miles west of Mentha. And then uh, they'd come to Mentha as field hands, pretty much. We had a full-time complement of of a uh, higher level of uh, tractor drivers and whatnot. We had a boarding, a boarding house there as well. But it was a system that uh, wasn't very efficient. Uh, we had a lot of turnover. And ultimately, we settled on uh, uh, contracting year long or season long employees uh, from Texas. Somewhat later, but large numbers of migrant workers came into the area. And there were other crops in which they worked, the tomatoes particularly in Indiana, and they moved on through from, from uh, uh, mint and, and uh, tomatoes and then on into Michigan in, in pickles and then into potatoes and onions. And so there, there was quite a large migrant labor force uh, that uh, came into the area. Relatively few of them stayed over the winter. I mean, they were truly migrant, mostly from Texas, mostly Latin Americans of Latin American origin from Texas. Oh, well, yes, we worked hard. We worked a lot of hours. How long did you work during the day? During the day, we started about, about 7 until about 5. I am the third generation of Medina. Uh, to work in the Crosby Fields. This is my grandfather, Natividad Vega Medina, Sr., and my grandmother, Romana Barajas Medina. This picture was taken circa 1935. My grandfather just died recently, but uh, uh, my grandmother s survived to be a beautiful, strong-spirited, wonderful woman. We were the first uh, Mexican American families that would come to, to St. John's, work in, in mint and beets. My family goes back to the early 1920s in St. John's. We migrated from Mexico and through Texas and was the first Mexican-American family to settle in these parts. My family worked for the Crosby family. Uh, Drive by that old still, does it bring back memories? I always tell my, always tell my granddaughters and my daughters, your grandpa worked there, so you told me that before, Mom. <laughs> I always said, your grandpa worked there, and that still. And I uh, am a bricklayer by trade, but when I get out of work, uh, usually most weekdays and on weekends, I enjoy coming out and driving tractor, and I, I love to help with the planting and the harvest and, and bottling oils. Uh, it's, it would be hard to describe the feeling that, uh, that you get while working a mint field. Uh, especially on this land. It just, it goes back, uh, well, as I said, three generations for me. In the early history of the plant and the crop where it was necessary to literally go in by hand and dig these things out with, with forks or plow them out with a, with a horse and, and, and moldboard plow, plow them out on top of the ground and then pick them up and, and carry them to a new field. The time involved there and, and the amount that they could do in a day was, was very limited. A, a worker working 10 or more hours a day and working hard would be lucky to plant one acre of mid a day. It was all stoop labor, we, we like to call it, the hard labor involved. Now we have machines that uh, will do it on, on a mechanical basis. Well, it's, it's highly mechanized today. Um, it's uh, hardly ever touched by hand anymore. Uh, strictly uh, planted mechanically. Uh, it's initially dug, mint is a sterile plant, and so it's planted, propagated from rootstock which is dug with a mechanical digger or lifter, lifts the roots, 
those are trans uh, transferred into a planter, usually by a loader of some sort. Uh, the mechanical planter will plant uh, anywhere from four to several rows at a time. And then we, we used to uh, have like a manure spreader uh, fix. We had a box in the center that made a trough on each side. And we'd stand in that. We pitched the roots in the troughs on the side. And one guy would drive the tractor. And you go across the field and plant it. That was a lot easier doing it by hand. Did you have plenty of time to think about things out there? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's about all you did was how to, you, you thought a lot about how you could improve this operation that you were doing. And most of the uh, improvements and mechanization that's come into the mint industry have been by the people involved in the little farm shops in, uh, in the communities where the mint is grown. And then we uh, started making, like this machine here that I made uh, in my shop one winter, and uh, we do it four rows at a time. And we don't have to have a man in the spreader or anything at all, funnels into the rows. Well, these apron chains bring the mint roots to the front of this spreader, and then they uh, feed into these beaters. These beaters, uh, pull the roots apart and throw it down in the front into the chutes that uh, plant it into the ground. Now this here is a design of a beater I've made up myself and it's, it's worked real good for us. We have a, this top uh, one levels the roots off so you don't get big wads going down. We used, used to uh, dump, dump the roots in the back end with the uh, manure spreader and level them off a little bit. and. As we go across the field, the power takeoff uh, brings the roots to the front. There's beaters in the front of it that will pick the roots apart and it'll drop down through these chutes. And these chutes are behind these openers here, just like they used to be. Come back, we got a, a packer that kind of packs the mint roots down a little bit and then dirt covered over them. And then the big wheels behind uh, pack it down so it holds the moisture. With our present mechanical planters, we can plant, a, a one man can plant 60 to 80 acres a day. Peppermint is uh, quite an extensive crop to take care of. For the amount of days you spend, it's also expensive. A lot of inputs, a lot of uh, agricultural inputs and labor inputs that you put into the crop. It takes a lot of machinery. We call it distillation, and, it, and in, in the true physical sense, it, it really, you're not truly distilling per se, but rather by means of steam, you are able to volatilize the oil from the surface of the plant by means of the, of the increase in temperature, volatilize the oil in a, in a vapor phase, and then by cooling the vapor, and you're cooling both the steam and the oil. Once it's cooled and back to a liquid phase, then the two separate, the oil separates from the water, and it makes it very easy to recover. You certainly have to have still or, or the ability to find a still nearby uh, to distill the oil. Uh, you can't have mid oil without a still. The, the plastic uh, uh, still, uh, uh, consists of, first of all, a steam source, which means a, a, br a, a boiler. Uh, and uh, again, these are typically, in the early days, they were coal-fired, even wood-fired, uh, but uh, subsequently then, with, with other petroleum-based fuels, uh, uh, like oil or natural gas. But so there's a, a boiler, uh, a receptacle, uh, which essentially the gore uh, refers to as a, as a tub, uh, in which the uh, mint uh, hay or material is placed. Uh, that, that tub has to be fitted with steam lines, which permits the steam then to course through uh, the mint hay. Uh, it's then conducted uh, into a cooling uh, structure, which is referred to as a condenser, and it's a water-cooled structure, which permits then uh, uh, f to reduce the volatile uh, uh, steam and oil to back to liquid uh, by cooling. That subsequently then is conducted into uh, uh, a separation tank, uh, so-called separators, 
uh, which permits the oil and water to physically separate and the oil coming to the top and then it, it can be recovered then in that particular container. The, the American farmer, even in our industry, uh, has developed things that allow them to be more efficient and produce things by their own ingenuity that it has ju just been astounding. I have seen mint produced using a single hole plow. I, I've seen uh, farmers use um, weed control equipment that was drawn by a team of horses. I've seen the mint harvested that has been mowed with a team of horses. I've seen it raked and put into windrows with a team of horses. Now remember, this can be one operation today. Well, it's so refreshing to see some with the, one with a pitchfork out here. I've been... Well, just, I'm waiting on another wagon to come in, and so I might as well be here saving a little mint where we lost between the rows here. Well, now you're such a young looking man, just like I am, of course. Yeah. Uh, do you remember the days when people would just take a wagon out there and they would hand pitch it on? Pitch it on by hand, that's right. Did you ever do that? I never did it myself, but I, as a kid, I seen the men do that. And then they would, they would get it into the still, they'd load the still by hand, and then they would take it out of the out of the tub with the still by hand. That was, was a hard way to do it, but that's the way to cut it. Now we got mechanization. Well, that's the name of the game. Now, what does your chopper do? How does it work? Well, the chopper picks the mint up out of the windrow when we rake it into windrows, chops it blows it into the, to the wagon so we can take it to the still and, and steam it to get the uh, oil from the, from the leaves. And your little control there where you have your hand, what do those buttons do, all those little switches? Well, this one directs the snout up and down. This one directs the snout sideways. This raises the lowers the pickup table. This one moves the pickup table in or out. This one throws it on automatic on the snout. This one disconnects the chopper when you get a load. So you don't have to get out and do it by hand. You kind of get used to them and you operate them without even looking at them. Initially, uh, this was handled almost like a hay crop. In other words, it was mowed uh, and, and uh, brought in, uh, literally pitchforked uh, onto wagons and hauled in uh, like a hay crop. Well, after you uh, loaded up uh, a wagon, of course, you would bring it into the mint distill. And uh, we had just two round vats. And uh, then you had to get up there on the wagon with a pitchfork and pitch it all back into the uh, mint tub. You were dealing with this so-called long hay. And, and in that instance then is when the, uh, uh, it was necessary to literally tromp it into those tubs because to be sure that you didn't get into channelization. There was a set of pipes on the bottom holes in them. And as the steam come up, if it broke through as you were stomping, you'd get yelled at, and Uncle Dave would, <laughs> because you'd want that steam to rise equally in all parts. You got about half full, and then you had three, four uh, kids, uh, we call them trampers, that would get inside and just keep tramping it down with, with their weight. And of course, you'd like to get the biggest and the fattest, heaviest kids in the bunch, and, and and all while you're doing that, well, the steam would be coming up from the bottom of the mint tub up through the uh, hay. And of course, with tramping and packing, you got a lot more in. If you just uh, pitched in a long hay, it would just take a few forkfuls to fill your tank up. But if you st uh, had three or four guys in there tramping, then would what we call put the steam to it, well, you could put an unheard of amount of hay in if you just kept tramping. We used to, uh, when we get up toward the top, we'd reach down, reach on the side, see how far the steam was coming up in it, and 
where we'd uh, have to jump out and get the cover on just before the steam come up through. And the way you would gauge whether you were tromping it equally is the fact that you'd get a leaker, we called them, uh, and you'd throw a pitchfork of hay on it and stomp, stomp, stomp there, and then some more would come, and pretty soon you get a leaker over here and you'd stomp, 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 see, and until uh, you got it up to the top. Oh, yes, we always had fun. Always working with a group of people, and uh, it was just, you know, you visit as you work. All the guys that, that were in high school that I sort of followed in football, they came out and worked for Dad, and there's and I can see them now. They, in the round tubs, they would get in there and stomp that down as they'd pitch it in, and they'd tromp it down. And they'd put their arms around each other and, you know, around and just jump up and down, you know, just take it down. It was green meant putting in, and after the steam went through it, actually the only thing you're taking back out is the oil. Uh, the, the leaves, the stem, and everything else is, uh, is there. And uh, it's just uh, brownish, uh, very hot from the steam yet. And um, so we would uh, load that on a uh, wagon. And uh, uh, one tub would, would fill a wagon. Usually you'd have about four pulls with the forks. And it also was no fun to take the hay out of them hot tubs because they'd take the lid off and, and it was hotter than blazes in there and steam and you had to get right in there and get that hay out so you could put in, put in the next load. Yeah, that was always something to jump down in the tub, especially that last pull because you'd be down, uh, I believe those tubs was, uh, what, 10? 10, 12 feet high, and I mean the steam would just be rolling and lots of times you really couldn't see down there, but somebody had to go down there and, and set the forks on that last pull. And uh, when you'd come back up, I mean, uh, you were really hot and sweaty and steamy and smelly, and, and then you would take it out uh, to the field and usually we we throwed it off on both sides of the wagon in little piles. Well then after we would get done distilling, at the end of the season, you'd take the crew out there with three tiny pitchforks and scatter it so it'd be like fertilizer or mulch. And it was good. You could tell right to the row where you put that, your health and moisture better. And uh, it was well worth the effort to put it back on. Well, as uh, we named the farm Beefo Mint because we had uh, about 650 head of steers that we was feeding, and we was raising the mint. We uh, was feeding the uh, spent hay to the uh, steers, and uh, along with uh, grain and uh, corn silage. Well, it kind of fell in line to come out with the Beefo Mint. You were talking about stomping mint. That's how they did it. They did it in stationary tubs. And somebody developed the idea to put those mint tubs on wheels and carry them to the field. Yes, that was a system, I think, designed and installed by Dick Stroud, who was uh, uh, an Englishman who came to, to, who was hired by my grandfather and made a number of very significant improvements to the way mint is grown and harvested. And. Uh, <clears throat> he was the first, I believe, to introduce these portable tanks that would, were then mounted on their own carriages, four-wheeled carriages, pull, pulled behind a tractor or by horses. Uh, then the um, mowed mint was uh, pitched into those tanks. Well, it's a drawing in which my father's printing is exp explanatory, and it says, this drawing made when the first idea of loading into frames came to R.F. Stroud at Mentha, Michigan. All construction and improvements on the idea anywhere in the USA were based on this original thought, and it is called One Ton Tramped Mint Wagon. And down below it says Mentha, Michigan, Anno Domino 1923. These um, portable tubs were uh, taken out onto the fields and there the mint had already been cut 
and in, was in cocks like haycocks. And those haycocks were pitchforked into the portable tub. And when it was full and tramped down, uh, it was transported, in those days, uh, it, was to, it was with tractors, to the distillery, which might be a mile or more away, uh, and it was speeding up the process of, of getting the mint to the distillery. One improvement we made was to find a side delivery mechanical rake, uh, uh, which would pick up, the, uh, pick up these windrows of mint and deliver them through a side elevator up to these field tanks, which are running alongside. And then we had a couple of men in the tanks pulling the hay on in. And from time to time, you'd hear a shout when, <laughs> across the field uh, because they'd pull an occasional rattlesnake in with a load. But uh, uh, that was, uh, that was an, a significant improvement. And when it got to the distillery, uh, those portable tubs had uh, 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 chain-linked uh, floors in them that they could be hooked up to the crane in the distillery and lifted out in mass and swung around into one of the tubs in the distillery where they would turn on the steam and that would be cooking the mint and the mint oil would flow into the uh, next building. The tub then went from that so-called stationary tub uh, to uh, mounting it on wheels and taking it into the field, which meant that at that time then, you literally picked the hay up out of the wind row and by means of an elevator, uh, carried it up into the tub and there were a group of three or four or more people up there who, who literally trumped it uh, in the tub uh, to be sure that, again, you got a uniform packing in the tub to avoid channeling and, and that type of thing. Up until about 1940, most mint was loaded with a uh, horse-drawn hay loader. Uh, it was loose, long-stemmed hay placed on the wagons and then brought into the uh, distillery building and pitched off with a pitchfork into the vat. Well, that was negated when they then went to a chopper system uh, where uh, the uh, uh, hay was was mowed in, into a windrow, and and then they brought the chopper directly. and And this is simply a modified silage chopper, the same sort of chopper that they would use for making silage, uh, in in which the hay was simply chopped in and then elevated directly into the tub. That precluded the necessity then for for further trumping because that settled more uniformly You'd, and you could get a lot more of their hay or herbage into a tub. In 1948, we were the first ones in this area to uh, have the tanks and uh, word spread around and uh, we had a continuous uh, flow of visitors over at the old still on 27. They just come in to see what it was like and. Uh, after that, the, the next year, why everybody was switching over to the same thing. So, my dad was one of the pioneers that started it, and I think he got probably got the idea from Clyde Anderson too, because Clyde was uh, operating in Emily City at that time, and then he'd been out to the West Coast and seen a lot of their operations. So, that was the first year that the mint was chopped, of course, with a with a hay chopper, and that was a, that was a big move too. Probably at about 1945 or so, they, they began using these choppers instead of uh, the old hay loaders. It, this machine probably replaced uh, three or four men out in the field. Now some growers still felt, well, you needed to get up there and be sure the load was leveled and packed, and so they would still do some of that. And you still had to stomp because uh, as the chopper, the chopper came in then, and it elevated it up into the tub, but you had to have men in there spreading it out and tramping it down to get a big load on. The tops were removed. Most of the tops hung in the distillery. Uh, so we, we pulled around a, uh, an open top tub. Uh, the material was dropped in from the top and then pitched around with pitchforks and, and tromped manually. 
and then the tubs brought into the still and the, the lids uh, lowered and uh, uh, sealed a lot like you would on a pressure cooker uh, canning. How much fun was it to be in the back of one of these uh, open tubs and have a chopper uh, blowing in uh, chopped, uh, chopped minhay? Well, uh, not, not very fun at all, actually. Uh, spent most of your time picking the stuff out of your eyes and uh, waiting for the scabs to fall off from the pitchfork wounds. But, uh, you know, there was a lot of camaraderie back then, too. Uh, uh, you had a lot more labor. Uh, you were working side by side with a lot of the people, so it probably certainly wasn't as lonely back then, but a lot harder work. In the years I've been in business, the biggest change, I think, was coming from uh, the open tanks on the truck where you tromped them in, in and then brought it to the distillery to the enclosed tanks that we have today, uh, which uh, cut down on a lot of labor uh, and has made a neat, neater operation as far as I can, can see. Most growers uh, have come with covered lids, or uh, the whole tub is covered with just a little lid in front, and they just blow it through that Not hole. Like right. Whereas this is sort of the older system where you... Uh, the whole lid lifts off this one. Well, it, is it hard to lift that up? Well, it would be if you tried to do it by hand, but How we've do do we've got a winch inside that just lifts it straight up. Well, the next innovation then was to go to, to rectangular closed tubs in which the opening was on the end of, of the tub. And uh, the, again, the hay was chopped and blown directly uh, into that unit. Larger capacity, uh, closed top, made more efficient uh, uh, distillation or volatilization of the oil. The process essentially was the same, simply the, the shape and, and type of tub that could be taken directly into the field and, and filled in that way. Richard, when did they go to the uh, closed tubs, do you think? Well, for us, it was around uh, 71 or 72, but uh, some had started early as the late 60s. And I would say by the mid 70s, just about all uh, tubs were enclosed and there wasn't any hand operation done. And there have been many, many innovations of that, of that portable tub, the rectangular portable tub. One of the limiting factors of growing mint is you have to have the equipment to distill the oil from the hay that's grown in the field. And that is quite an expensive uh, uh, operation to get involved with. It involves choppers and trucks and uh, the distillery itself, which is uh, constituted with a, a boiler, a big boiler, to generate a lot of steam. Each of these are, are unique, des uniquely designed structures adapted for this process. And because of the fact that, that this is a relatively small industry, most of these are, are custom built or built on the farm. Uh, so they vary in design somewhat. They vary in terms of the needs for the grower. Well, we have three stalls here. At, uh, we can run three tanks at a time and uh, three separate condensers that, uh, that the uh, steam run, runs into. So most of the stills today, the, this is sort of a primitive still. <laughs> today, uh, most people have uh, a lot more stalls. Maybe they'll have eight stalls and, and uh, 300 horse boilers. But this, this boiler is probably uh, about a 100 horse boiler. And we have two boilers. and. Uh, connected together. So it was put up, like I said, in 1968 by Clyde, Clyde uh, Anderson. Uh, Hilda, uh, J. E. Crosby has, has spoken of, uh, of your father with uh, reverence. And he seems to have had yeah. quite a reputation. I don't know how they got along without him. Because it, to me, I was rather jealous because he was never home between July and August during the mint stilling time because things would break down and he'd have to be there to fix them. During July and August, he was gone from home a lot, uh, repairing pumps and coils and boilers, boilers and boilers. 
he would even go to away from home to get a new boiler or a new old boiler and rebuild it. Well, I've got this burning desire to become a mint farmer. How much money do I have to come up with for a still? To <coughs> well, there are different size stills, but uh, I would say a couple hundred thousand dollars now would to uh, get all the equipment that you need for a moderate size still. When you first started, how much would a still have cost? Twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars And it is not something that a grower can literally jump into, jump out of on a short-term basis as he might uh, with a crop that does not require that sort of long-term investment. So it is a major capital investment, uh, and it requires some time to recover uh, that initial uh, primary capital cost. For example, if you're going to harvest 500 acres of mint, as maybe on this, that's what we're talking about here uh, in this size field, you would probably spend in the neighborhood of 250 to $300,000 for equipment. It's not for the faint of heart. Well, this stand of peppermint is, uh, we probably harvest in about a, oh, I'd say a month. It probably looks pretty good right now because it's all standing up, but uh, within oh, a week or two, the foliage will all start uh, laying over, they call it lodging, and then we'll start getting some blooms. And about the time uh, you start seeing the bloom, maybe 10% bloom is when we'll, uh, cut it for oil. Well, this is a commercial mint still, and this piece of equipment is a uh, mint tub. It's used to transport the mint and process the mint. It's connected to a commercial forage harvester in the field, and while the mint is being chopped, it's blown into this tub through this small door at the top. The mint's chopped into a half inch pieces, so it's fairly fine, and it's a fairly high moisture content when it does that. This tub will hold five to six tons of green chopped mint. On the floor of the tub, there's a manifold, and this manifold has six uh, half-inch pipes connected to it. It runs the length of the floor of the tub, and every 12 inches, there's a hole drilled in it to allow steam to escape. We hook the manifold to a steam line and apply steam. We create the steam with the boiler uh, behind me here. It's just a commercial um, steam boiler, diesel-fired steam boiler, similar to what you'd find in a, to heat a building with or to use in maybe a textile mill or something of that nature. Okay. The steam enters the boiler. We maintain it at around 30 pounds, which will create approximately a 250 degree temperature inside the tub. The steam travels up the tub through the mint and vaporizing the oil while it does that. So it basically turns the oil from a liquid state to a gaseous state. We catch the oil and steam at the top of the tub through this vapor tube, the black assembly connected to the aluminum pipe. We transfer the, the vapor at this point back over to the distillery, to the, initially to the condensers. This is the condensing separating mechanism we use in the mint distillery. The vapor that we just created, the oil and steam vapor that we've created in the tub and captured, brought in through an aluminum piping system, goes into the top of this unit. This is called a condenser. The vapor comes down through those pipes, which are surrounded by water on the water side of the condenser. As the vapor moves down, it goes from 250 degrees. We take it down to approximately 120 degrees at the bottom of the condenser where the vapor exits, and it's now a liquid. Temp this temperature is controlled by electronic valves that allow regulate the flow of cold water around the condensing tubes inside the condenser. So as it leaves the condenser, we've taken our steam mint oil and steam vapor and created a oil or a liquid solution out of it, which enters the separator can at the bottom. This can has a baffle inside of, which is the water and oil, the steam that is now water and oil floats to the top. The oil floats on up the top into this tube. The water floats out of this tube. We recycle the water through the steam boiler and capture the mint oil in these tanks, which we later, after it's measured and looked at, drain into a 55-gallon drum for transport. And that's the basic process of creating mint oil.
We bring these tubs full of mid hay, these wagons full of mid hay, into, into the distillery building. We blow live steam in the bottom of the wagons. This load is just uh, all done cooking. There's no more smell on the steam. And uh, we just opened up the uh, door on the front of the wagon. The steam hose has been on hook. He's raising the uh, cover, the lid off the wagon. He'll now back a small tractor up, hook onto number seven wagon, and pull it out of the stall. We're using an automatic hitch system on our wagon. Uh, he could just back up, pick up that wagon, pull it out. We have another wagon coming in right in behind us. Uh, this stall was probably only down a minute or a minute and a half. In this particular sale, when the load is finished cooking, when you can smell no more oil coming from the load, uh, we turn the steam off, remove the uh, steam hose on the bottom, take the cover off the top, pull the wagon out with a small a yard tractor and park it. And then one of the uh, road tractor drivers picks up the uh, spent mint hay load, takes it back to the field. Uh, at the field, we dump this uh, spent mint hay into a, a custom designed spreader that we've put together here on the farm and spread the uh, hot mint uh, charge directly back onto the field from which it came. Uh, yeah, I suppose it could if they had a desire to do it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a good life, but it's not a real easy life, you know. You gotta want to do her to ever make it. Farming is a good life. You know, some people, they like to have a boss, or seem to like they need a boss, or a foreman. They like to fix their lunch and go and work so many hours and, and uh, go home. And uh, the farm life is, is different. Uh, farm life, you're uh, actually your own boss. We know that it's our responsibility and it's our way of life of getting a crop in and, and harvesting and uh, growing it. There's been many a times where I would wake up in the morning and uh, instantaneously start thinking about the day's job and uh, would break out in a sweat and, and have to get up and go. And getting here about six in the morning, making sure your day crew shows up and everything lined out and proceeding on and Hope everything holds together for the day, you know. Some days you have good days, equipment breaking down, some days you have bad days. And in the evening, about 6.30, you get back, make sure there's your night crew showing up, and a good day, uh, you'll get to bed at 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock, and if everything goes to, <clears throat> breaks down and has a rough time, no telling when you'll get to bed, but that's a typical day in distilling. Still very impressive, very well organized, very clean. How many tubs can you handle at one time? Eight. And how long does it take for each tub, uh, for each load to be still? <clears throat> kind of depends on the conditions of hay. If it's dry, you know, it takes an hour and 45 minutes, hour and a half. If it's green, it takes longer. We take a sample of a condensate from the load to determine if uh, how much oil is still coming out. We pour it in a Coke bottle, and if there's any oil in the load, it will collect on top of the water. And it'll form a head on the top right here. This load appears to have quite a bit of oil coming out still. Uh, over time, you come to realize maybe it's not so imperative that it has to be done right away, that uh, it will get done. But yes, I have had a lot of worries sometimes at, at getting the crop in and uh, just making sure that the, the fields are irrigated and, and harvest is definitely a stressful period. However, it is a very 
fun period too because we have a lot of people employed driving truck and chopper and windrower and it it's a social event as well as a harvest event it's a, it can be a fun period too i i enjoy it oh it's a great feeling it's a, it's a different feeling if if you get uh, get a crop that's really yielding good why well, it's uh, a lot of fun just it's fantastic feeling to cuz uh, my children are all uh, around most of the time during stilling time, you know, and they'll run down and look at the receiving can and say, oh, Dad, we're going we're gonna to have a good, good load this time, you know, and they keep track of it, and it's a lot of fun. Family farm that, uh, that I was raised up with, uh, the diversification of a few cows and some chickens and some pigs and, and uh, small dairy herd that we milked the cows, and, and we virtually did most of our labor on the farm ourselves. Those days are gone. And that was a good life. The farming we have now is, it is more than a way of life. It's actually a business. It's still a way of life. It's a good life. But it's not like it was uh, when, as a child and as a young person when I grew up.